Hey everyone, I just wanted to say that I miss y'all and I hope we can gather again soon and that I'm thinking about you. Uh, I just want to thank y'all for all your support during this time. Uh, it's been really uncertain, but I'm glad we had you there behind us. Hey y'all, I love and miss y'all so much. Thank you for all your thoughts and prayers. Go Wildcats! Hey, I miss all of you. Thank you so much for your support during these tough times. I'd like to thank the Southwest Church family for helping me become a better Christian and getting me where I am today. It's helping me through, helping me throughout everything. And I'd like to thank Adrian Morgan for always just taking care of me and the other seniors. And thank you, uh, Quinn and Ashley, um, being my house parents and helping me um, to accomplish what I've done. Thank you very much. Hey guys, missing y'all. Hey, can't wait to come back to church. I miss everyone. Hi everybody, miss you. Hey church, uh, this is Nathan Collier. Uh, I just miss y'all guys so much. I can't wait to be back at church. Thank y'all. Hey Southwest, thank you guys. Hey Southwest, thank you so much for all the support uh, for all the seniors. Hope y'all are staying safe and healthy and we hope to see you soon. Congratulations to the class of 2020. Church, and welcome to our online offering for May 24th, 2020. We're glad that you could join us online this morning. I love seeing our seniors in their caps and gowns and class of 2020. We are proud of you, and uh, we haven't forgotten you. Church, we are planning on a special event for our seniors in late June uh, to celebrate them as we usually would in our Senior Sunday. Uh, but Church, I encourage you to not forget our seniors. You you may know that this is the weekend that our seniors would have graduated uh, in their graduation ceremonies, uh, but, but they're hopefully going to get one down the road. Church, uh, keep checking in and letting us know that you're here. Share our service on Facebook. You can hit the share button on our Facebook feed and share that on your Facebook timeline to invite others. Remember, the more you share, uh, the more chance there is of the message of Jesus getting uh, to more people. We had so many that shared it last week. And we thank you for that. Keep on doing it. Let's see if we can set a record uh, for how many shares we get. And if you'll comment on our Facebook page just to let us know that you're with us and that you're worshiping with us this morning, we'd love that. Visitors, you can visit letusknow.southwest.org and you can let us know that you're here and you can ask any questions about our church that you want to. But thank you uh, for being with us this week. I, I heard from another uh, former member from South Dakota last week uh, that's been watching our service. And so... Uh, it's, it's good to hear from former members. Actually, I've heard from several former members that are worshiping with us. You might hear my dog snoring in the background. That's what we get when we have worship at our house. So hope that doesn't bother you too much. Keep checking our website, our midweek video, the Friday Five, and our bulletin for the latest information on the church family. We are now in phase one of reopening our, our church building. But phase one, remember, is worshiping in homes. So some of our members are worshiping with smaller groups in their homes. I hope some of you are doing that this morning. Uh, we want you to be safe in that. For all the information on that, go to our Friday Five and our midweek video. Those are the best places to find that information. Uh, and check those each week. We have a special anniversary this week that we're celebrating on May 28th. Larry and Marita Collier celebrate 54 years. So if you know them, Larry and Marita, uh, we say happy anniversary to you, and we would normally have them stand now. But please send them a card and encourage them right now. I know that that would be a huge encouragement 
uh, to both of them. Also, in these strange times, we don't want to forget to bless some of our longtime members who are now getting married. Uh, they're, they're growing up and getting married. We're having a shower for Madison Moore. She's getting married to Brendan Pearson on May 31st. She's not getting married on May 31st. They're having the shower on May 31st. They're following social distancing guidelines. All the details of that is in your bulletin this week. So go online and look at our bulletin. But don't forget, let's bless this young couple. And now for our worship, as always, I remind you to pause and have great conversations with your family that you wouldn't be able to do if we were all together in our worship service. Now, some of my friends were giving me a hard time this week because I say this every week and because every week it busts them. Uh, every week I say, check your posture and lean forward. And I do that because it's important for us to remember when we're in our homes, we're not just watching like we would watch TV. We are engaging in worship of the Father. So check your posture, lean in, and worship together. This morning, again, we had so much good feedback last week to our Swing Low song that our family wanted to do uh, another children's song. So we're going to sing Wrapped Up, Tied Up, and This Little Light. So you've got to stand to sing these songs. Do the motions with them. Children, we are so glad you're worshiping with your family in your homes. Keep on doing it. Let's sing together. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. Let the fountain I drink from, all oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, for oh, He is my song. You are good, good Lord. 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 Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, all oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, all oh, is my song. You are good, good Lord, you are good, good Lord. We. Mm -hmm. 
who are joining us once again for our worship online. Everyone, you're just most welcome. Hey, listen, I want to start right off the bat here by encouraging all of you, any of you, who haven't decided to join us in our Southwest 2020 Bible Project, I really want to encourage you and invite you to join us. Really, truth be told, I want to insist that you join us. I know I can't insist you join us. We're all our own people and we're free, we do what we want, but it feels unloving to me to not just look at you and say, I really, really encourage you and want you to join us. Let me let me explain by telling you another story where I felt this feeling. A lot of you know, I 
I go on big trips, one big trip every summer with one of my kids and I rotate through them. And one of the big trips that I took was with my oldest son, Shade, when he was in high school. We went overlanding. I didn't even know what overlanding was until he told me that's what he wanted to do. So we started planning and saving up for it. Who knew you can take your four wheel drive vehicle and there are routes that you can go on all over the world where you drive and you camp and you drive and you camp and you explore. So we chose an overlanding route in Colorado up in the mountains. And one of the agendas we had was to go up this little side trail just up as high as we could in his truck at the foot of Mount Handys, a 14,000 foot peak there in Colorado that we wanted to park and try to get up to the top of and back down in a day. And so we set out with our day packs and uh, we saw some beautiful sights, but we get up above the tree line and boy, we're pretty exhausted in that altitude and, and all of that. And so we sit down once again on a rock and we're resting and Shade says, Dad, I, I think I'm done. Why don't you, if you want to go up to the top and sign the log and take your pictures and I'll just be here when you get back. And I, I mean, I've got a few years on Shade, so I'm feeling what he's feeling. And honestly, it was awful tempting sitting there comfortably on that rock to just say, hey, this is beautiful enough, let's go down. But I've also climbed a few 14ers in my life and I know what it is to push through that wall and to continue on the trek all the way to the top. There's just a lot of reward to it. So I stand up and I say, Shade, no, we've got to go and finish this trek and get all the way to the top. And I insisted. Now, of course, I couldn't insist. He had to decide to get up and decide to come with me all the way to the top. And we did. And to this day, I asked him before I recorded, to this day, he'll say, yes, absolutely, it was worth it. So that's kind of how I feel, that it was loving to insist that he continue, just like God had all kinds of special sights and gifts for us uh, on that trek up to the summit of Mount Handys. God has all kinds of special sights and gifts for you if you will trek through the story of God through scripture. And so I really hope you'll join us or if you started well and you've fallen off, just pick right back up. You don't even need to catch up. Just start off. You can get the schedule right here on this website and there are handy links right there. You can go right to each day's uh, assignment, whether it's a video or it's a Bible reading, just a couple of chapters a day or a seven or eight minute video. I really encourage you to do it. In that same spot, you can sign up for a weekly email. That's what I did. So I get my weekly email Monday morning and it has the, the links just right there conveniently in that email. So friends, friends, join us, join us. You will not regret it. Sometimes it does seem like work, just like mountain climbing, okay? I'm just saying it's worth it. All right, now, in this last week's reading, and I always pick something from the last week's reading to teach from, so you'll already know my source material each week when you join us here. Uh, we finished up the reign of King Solomon over the nation of Israel. Now, uh, you'll notice that things really started picking up this week in terms of pace. I mean, Solomon, we just met him last week, and now we're finishing with him this week. And that's after four straight weeks of getting to know the character King David, Solomon's dad. But you might as well buckle in because things really pick up from here. In this last week's reading, which was just 10 chapters, not only do we finish Solomon's reign, but we cover 11 more kings, okay, in total in this week's reading. And we only slow down on one king, King Ahab, towards the end, long enough to meet the next major character in the book of 1 Kings, and that's the great prophet Elijah. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here because I want to pause here and say it's important for you to know why Solomon's reign finished up badly. I think there's an application for us. Now you'll remember his dad, King David, uh, was known as a man after God's own heart, even though he made mistakes, like big mistakes. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There's no sugarcoating that. However, David never left his full-hearted devotion to God. Even when he fell, he always returned because he had this full-hearted devotion to God. And that's God's biggest deal, okay? He has a lot of grace, but he really wants us to serve and worship and follow him alone. David did that, 
And unfortunately, Solomon didn't inherit that quality. At least he didn't carry it into his reign as a king. At best, Solomon could be said to have had a divided heart, okay? Because he ended up um, worshiping other gods from the surrounding territory. Now, it's 1 Kings chapter 11. We won't read the whole thing, but I'll read a few just to give you a sense of how this happened because it's explained there. Starting in verse 1, it says, King Solomon loved many foreign women, Egyptian, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite. And as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. So a little bit later, it says that God spoke to, Sam, I mean to, to Solomon. He said, so the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it from the hand of your son. Yet, I will not tear the whole kingdom from him but will give him one tribe for the sake of David and for the sake of Jerusalem, both of which I have chosen. So from this point forward, Israel becomes a divided nation. And that's important to point out here. So Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and he's going to be the one that inherits um, uh, well, the one nation of Judah. That's David's nation. Rehoboam is a son of David. He will remain in Jerusalem. That's where Jerusalem is. Eventually, Benjamin will, will join Judah, and those two tribes will make up the southern nation, which takes on the name of Judah. And now, Jeroboam, not Rehoboam, but Jeroboam was the subordinate of Solomon that was going to become king of the other ten tribes in the north, and they would retain, retain the name of Israel. So from here on out, nation of Israel is the northern kingdom, nation of Judah is the southern kingdom. Now, Jeroboam was in charge of Solomon's workforce, okay? But I want you to hear how Jeroboam found out he was going to become king of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. So there was this prophet named Ahijah. And Ahijah met up with Jeroboam when he was traveling somewhere. And it says in, we're still in chapter 11, starting in verse 30. This is how he found out. Ahijah took a hold of the new cloak he was wearing and he tore it. He tore it into 12 pieces, okay? And he took that, and then he tells, he tells Jeroboam, take 10 of these pieces of my robe that I've been wearing, okay, as this priest. Take, take 10 of them, and that's what's going to happen. That's what's happening. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom of Solomon's hand, tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand, and give you 10 tribes. So I just hold on to this imagery for later. But I want you to see how Solomon's divided heart resulted in a divided kingdom. And you saw it in verse 1 of chapter 11. He was divided in heart because of his love for his wives that he had invited in. He literally married. He didn't just invite them into their life. He married them. And so he cared about them. And so he cared about what they cared about. And they didn't care about God. They cared about their own gods. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pause and I want you to discuss a pretty important application to this teaching, I believe. So the first question is, how can your choices about who you hang out with tempt you to have a divided heart? Okay, in other words, who you hang out with matters. It doesn't have to be wives. For Solomon, it was his wives, but it's anyone that you invite into your orbit. We end up being like who we're around more often than not. And so I want you to discuss that. How can your choices concerning who you hang out with threaten to divide your heart between God and other things, other priorities? Okay, so uh, that's the first question I want you to discuss. And maybe you need to just talk about it, how that has been true in your past. Maybe you've gotten over that. The next question is, I want you to be honest and, and answer this with each other. Do you have two kingdoms in your life? Like, are there two kingdoms in your life? Or... Maybe in the past, have you had two kingdoms in your life? You know what I'm talking about? Do you have like your church friends with whom you act one way and then other friends with whom you act another way? Do you have certain environments, maybe church environments where you are fully devoted to God, 
But then you have other environments, maybe work or play or whatever in the world, and you've got some other priorities that float to the top. So I want you to discuss that because that's a very easy thing to fall into. And you know, it might not be that you have Christian friends and non-Christian friends and that's your deal. You may have all Christian friends, but do you and some of your Christian friends have this little wink wink deal where you'll act a certain way when you're at church environments, but you'll act another way when you're out in the world together? That's also having two kingdoms and it's easy to fall into. As a matter of fact, I don't know anyone who hasn't, including me. So I really want you to talk about that and how you see that playing out and or, or how it did play out in your life. After you have that conversation with each other, I want you to open up to 1 Kings uh, chapter 18 and I want you to read verses 17 through 40. This is an enormously entertaining chapter that describes this contest between the prophet Elijah, who I want you to meet, and King Ahab, who, which is really a contest between Yahweh, God, and Baal, who is Ahab's wife's God. So he suffered from the same divided heart that, uh, that Solomon did. But I want you to see when God confronts this attitude. But that's for later. Have your conversation and read this. One more thing. You might divide this up, this reading up. Have one person be the narrator and one person be Elijah. Just, just for variety's sake. There's a, maybe two lines for... Uh, the people. There's maybe a line for King Ahab. I think he starts the chapter with one line. You can have people read those too if you want, or the narrator just can. But have fun with it. Enjoy this story. And the person who's being Elijah needs to be someone who's really good at being sarcastic and mocking other people, because that, that'll be important in this chapter. Enjoy it, and then we'll finish up when you come back. I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Uh, you know, that chapter along with another chapter we read earlier in the project between the epic battle between Goliath and David. I mean, those two chapters like read like scenes in a movie. I just think they're really good. So I hope you enjoyed that. And there's so much there to explore, but I just wanna uh, stay on our theme of the divided heart that we're exploring. In verse 21, you remember Elijah, he, he's not talking to Ahab, he's not talking to the prophets of Baal, he's talking to the people of Israel. The people of God is the real target audience in this big performance that he has set up. He says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And that phrase in the NIV, which is what we're reading, this phrase, waver between two opinions, I looked at some other versions and here's some different ways it's said limping with two opinions, straddling the issue, sitting on the fence, we're familiar with that phrase, hobbling between the two sides. We get what God's after here, right? He is after the people of God. He wants them to be decisive and he wants them to be decisive towards him. He wants them to do, he knows what's best for them and he wants to care for them and he doesn't want to entrust them and their care and their provision and their hearts to anything or anyone else in the world. And so he's not just wanting them to have this undivided heart for him for his own purposes, like he's selfish. It's for his glory, but his glory is good for those people because he knows how he built them and he knows what they need. So you get the point here. In Elijah's prayer in verse 36, it states overtly the purpose of this contest. It says, O oh Lord, let it be known today that you are God. Answer my prayer so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. <laughs> I love that phrase because that really connects us to what God is still trying to do today. He's trying to let people know that he's God and he's trying to turn the whole world's hearts back to them, back to him, including yours, including yours, wherever it's divided. And this, just like all stories in scripture we've learned, it points us so clearly to the mission of Jesus on the cross, doesn't it? Um, see, God is glad to prove himself, not just in this part of the story, but in the larger story. And in no uncertain terms, as we follow this narrative to Jesus, we're going to find out that God loves you so much that he will send his own son to die for your sins, for your divided heart, just so that he can remain 
in intimate relationship with you. Jesus actually says something in his ministry that echoes this call uh, towards this um, undivided heart. It's in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. It says, No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and... Now, he says money here, okay? That's what he talks about. Um, and that's probably one that we could all fill in that blank, but I'm going to leave that blank there for you to consider what would you fill in there? What is your heart divided between God and what? Because Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You need one God. The good news is God is full of grace and he never stops pursuing you. Even in the Old Testament, he never stopped pursuing those Israelites even though their hearts were so divided. So even when bad kings led Israel astray, God sent this prophet Elijah to come in and show them, again, that their earthly king isn't always worthy of their allegiance, to, at least in terms of what they worship and who they follow and who they imitate. Only God is. So he's not looking to destroy Israel. He's looking to turn their hearts back again. So there's one more connection between this story and Jesus that I want to end with. And this takes us right to Jesus on that cross, okay? John chapter 19, you know, there's four books in the New Testament that tell the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And at, in the, they're, each of them depict the cross, of course, the crucifixion of Jesus where he died for our sins. But John adds a detail that's going on at the foot of the cross among the soldiers that crucified him that the other three don't add. And it says this in John 19, it says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and they divided them into four shares one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said. Let's decide by lot who will get it. Okay, so I've never had a good explanation or even a palatable explanation for why this detail is in John. John, nothing in John explains why he told us that detail that there was this one garment that Jesus was wearing that didn't get torn, okay? Uh, it, there's no reason for it. I know that the garments being divided, everything being divided between um, the soldiers was a prophecy in the Old Testament, but it mentions nothing about this one garment that didn't get torn. But I think we may have a little insight here. Do you remember earlier how uh, uh, Ahijah, he went to Jeroboam and he took the garment off of him as a prophet of God and he tore it into 12 pieces to explain how that divided heart resulted in this divided kingdom. I wonder if John is using just a little Jewish code for his Jewish readers, okay, that would know this story and they would be taken to torn garments when they read about the gospel of Jesus and how his garment that he is our high priest and as our king was wearing and how it didn't get ripped, that maybe this was a little Jewish code, a message saying that this king, this king is worthy, this king is sinless, this king is undivided in his commitment to you and you can in an undivided way be committed to him and give your undivided heart to him. I don't know if that's what it means, but it's a neat thought and it makes sense to me. You can, church, too. You can give your heart to God in an undivided way. It's the most safe, the most secure, and the most exciting place for you to lay your heart down. So as we finish today, I just want you to turn to David's prayer book, the book of Psalms, and I want you to read just a few verses out of Psalm 86, okay? Verses 11 through 13. After you read those, and you'll see why I want you to read those, I want you to go to verse 13, and I want you to share just briefly how has God shown you verse 13. Then I want you to back up to verse 12, and I want you to share how you've shown God, verse 12. And then just take those same three verses, bow together, and pray this prayer to God with a whole heart. I love you, church. Have a great day.